The next uh, presentation will be, will be given by, by Hanna Lanto, who is from the University of Eastern Finland, and, and her topic is, a no, uh, is a participation and personal investment in reclaiming an ethnic label. Hello, <laughs> and um, thank you uh, all for being here, and a uh, special thanks for the organizers of this symposium. So uh, the ethnic label that I'm talk going to talk about here is uh, uh, the label of Euskalduna or Basque or being Basque. And um, my research now focuses on the colloquial registers of non-native Basque speakers. And it's part of the um, larger Spanish project that examines the non-native speakers of the regional languages in Spain. Uh, Basque, Catalan, Galician, um, Aragonese, so on. So uh, the word that I'm going to focus on is this Euskalduna. Um, and it literally translates as uh, the one who has, has the Basque language. And it's the only word that you have in Basque to refer to Basques. So it's kind of a language-based ethnic identity. Um, then if you want to talk about people who live in the Basque country or are from the Basque country but are not Basque speakers, you have to resort to this kind of... <laughs> there's no like common term, it's more... Uh, people can say something about Euskal uh, Ritarrak, which means from the Basque country, or take the Spanish loan word Vasco, Vascoac. But um, this Euskalduna, um, yeah, it's like the, being Basque is defined by the language, the competence in, the, in Basque. And the Basque revitalization movement and the lang language advocates, they have tried to uh, stress the fact that um, as a language-based identity, being Euskalduna is um, an inclusive ethnic identity. So it's not like ancestry or race, but it's something that anyone can achieve or anyone can become. Uh, to uh, learning the language and practicing it in the daily interactions. So um, the responsibilities, like um, the in individual speaker has the responsibility of becoming uh, Euskalduna and practicing the, the language. And um, now that they were before, like uh, they were talking about more about the language competence, but now that they have seen in the Basque country that the language competence always does not um, correlate with the language use, with language use, so they have started to move the focus on the language practices, on the actual language practices. So it's not enough to know Basque, but to be Basque, to be Euskalduna, you actually have to use the language daily in your daily interactions. And this is in theory, um, I think it's um, very nice to have this kind of inclusive identity that um, in theory like everyone can take part, part, on it, part in it, and, but uh, of course it's always not so simple that not everyone is accepted as Euskalduna. Um, it used to be quite clear who was Basque and who was not, but now uh, in the recent, um, during the recent decades, three or four decades, uh, the social, social linguistic situation and the language dynamics have changed a lot in the Basque country, so um, they have been going through this process that they call a normalization or normalization. So um, it has many meanings. Uh, the first is like going back to the kind of normal state of affairs after the Spanish dictatorship. Because during the dictatorship, um, the public use of Basque and the other regional languages was, for, was forbidden. Um, and now they are trying to kind of um, um, yeah, promote the language and uh, to overcome the damage that was done by the, the dictatorship, dictatorship's policies. And it also means that they are creating, actively creating norms and standards for the minority language. For example, the standard Basque 
uh, Euskia Rabatua and the language authorities that um, kind of protect and create these norms for the standard variety and also create legislation to protect the minority language. And now the education has become like one of the a major strongholds of the Basque language. And for example, if 40 years ago, uh, almost no one uh, had, Bas had schooling in Basque, nowadays 80% of the children start their schools in Basque media models. So the change has been huge in the last 40 years. But um, now that uh, there are so many these kind of Basque speakers that do not fit the traditional profile of Euskalduna, uh, there have been these new divisions because before the Basque linguistic universe it was divided into two groups. There were these Euskaldunak Basque speakers and Erdaldunak non-Basque speakers. And um, er Erdera can refer to any language, any foreign or non-Basque language, but in the past context it used, it's mostly used to refer to French or Spanish. Um, now the term Euskalduna has been divided into Euskaldun Sarrak, the old Basque speakers, and Euskaldun Berriak, new Basque speakers. And uh, Euskaldun Sarrak are these native Basque speakers, uh, the traditional kind of minority language speakers who have learned the language in the primary socialization from their parents uh, in the village. They usually speak vernacular dialects of Basque and um, they are kind of automatically granted to linguist, linguistic authority of the language. So uh, their language competence goes unquestioned. And then you have the new Basque speakers, Euskal Berriak, who have learned the language in a classroom environment. They mostly use the Basque standard, Euskara Batua. And they even themselves often don't consider themselves as legitimate Basque speakers. So uh, this is a quote, Nies Nais Euskalduna, I'm not a Basque speaker, uh, that was said by a person who is actually using Basque every day in his life. He's even engaged in, engaged in uh, various forms of language activism. So it's often still this concept of Euskalduna is used as a synonym of Euskaldun Sarra, old Basque speaker, or native Basque speaker. But a lot of it is connected to the um, language varieties. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Basque standard, Euskera Batua, is now acquiring certain status or certain unmarked status uh, in public, public administration and schools. And it's the main variety that is used by the new speakers of Basque. But it's still um, perceived as formal and artificial, and people see it as unfit for informal use. So you can use it in school, but you are not supposed to use it on the street talking to your friends. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of natural then that uh, people who are always bilingual, or the Basque speakers are bilingual, that they would then use Spanish with, with their friends in these informal contexts. And then you have these Basque vernacular dialects, that's how you that usually function uh, as informal registers, but they are kind of property of the uh, old Basque pre speakers or traditional Basque speakers, and it would be kind of weird for um, for a new Basque speaker to adopt one of these these um, vernacular dialects because they are local. They are very much connected to a certain village or certain even part of village. And uh, there is no vernacular dialect of the Bilbao area because uh, they have become extinct uh, during the, they became extinct during the uh, 20th century. So what they have seen now that uh, even though the competence, the language competence is quite high, all, almost all the younger generations have learned Basque in school or they have been schooled in Basque, um, but the observed language use is very low, so kind of all, only uh, about 2% of the interactions 
in Bilbao, in the city of Bilbao or Kur, in Basque. Um, and um, it has been noted, it has been seen to be like a general problem in the Basque countries that those who learn the language in classroom context don't use it outside of the classroom. And one of the reasons, or the main reason, has been speculated to be that they lack the colloquial registers and pragmatics that are needed to function in the Basque speaking community. So they cannot fully uh, participate or uh, be accepted as Euskalduna if they lack these informa varieties. Um, I was in Bilbao last year uh, doing ethnographic work uh, during the Bilbao Festival Week in an association um, that promotes the use of Basque uh, in the city of Bilbao um, in this kind of informal party atmosphere. And um, I talked to a lot of people, but for this, <laughs> for this team, uh, I was very interested in, uh, in one group of friends and I was talking to Gonzal and Jon, who are both new Basque speakers from the city of Bilbao. So um, all the people, all the friends in the group, they had studies, background in studies of Basque philology or media and communication, journalism. So they were uh, language related somehow. Uh, Gonzal is working in, um, in a book editorial. Uh, Jon is working as a communications director in in a Basque speaking association. So they are all also um, engaged in this kind of language activism. But um, I found it very interesting that when Jon said somewhere that, okay, falta saigu euskera informal bat, vale, asma de So we are lacking uh, this informal variety of Basque. Okay, let's invent it, let's make it. Mm -hmm. And this is what they have done in their a group of friends. So, um, first, what they were doing, okay, are uh, using quite a lot of Spanish resources, this conversational coach which into Spanish, uh, to make it more expressive, borrow um, colloquial terms, coach which in uh, colloquial terms, uh, particularly swear words and insults. That's something that uh, almost all of us speakers do. Um, and uh, the other thing that they were doing was to um, borrow words from the local dialects and vernaculars. So if they went to a village with a strong vernacular, they could take one word or an expression uh, out of the dialect and start using it. But they could also extend the context of use uh, for their own group style. Like they use this word barro, for example, in the village, in the town of Ondarrua, uh, they say barro, uh, if, if someone is good looking. But in their group of friends, they had made it a more general way of saying that something is cool, that they like something. And uh, the word art, it means something like away or outside, so they use it then for everything they didn't like, so art, like uh, we don't like this. But what was the most interesting part for me was this, that when Gonzal said that we use a very special register, we make all the, the verbs synthetic. And he started giving me examples like alibides, uh, for example, da flipa, na mola, and so on. And <laughs> I think I have to explain a bit <laughs> what this means. That the Basque verbs, they are usually used in periphrastic form. So you have the main verb, and the main verb, um, marks the aspect. If something has uh, ended, if it's perfective, if it's something that's continuous, imperfective, if it refers to the future. And then uh, the, you have the auxiliary verb that shows the arguments. So uh, who is the subject in ergative, who is the object in accusative, and who is the um, dative or the so on. Uh, for example, you have the ekarri diskigusu here, like, um, which means that you have brought them to us. So you have this broad ekarri, and then you have the auxiliary diskigusu, where the PCs make this, uh, these, us, you, 
kind of that, this key busu. You have the glosses there also. Or if you have a verb with two arguments like this ikusi now su, you have seen me, you have ikusi, which is seen, and now su is like me, you. So you have this, um, in the auxiliary you have the absolutive object and the ergative subject there. Uh, but then there are some verbs that are used in their synthetic form. Um, they are usually the most common verbs such as to go, to come, to have, so on. And it's generally non-productive. So people always or usually speak about the 12 verbs that are used in this synthetic way. But, um, and yeah, uh, usually these synthetic verbs, especially if they are not used with these most common 12 verbs, they have very archaic and formal connotations. For example, they can be related to like law terms, very technical terms, or these uh, formulas of address in, if you are addressing a person, writing a letter to a person, very high in the hierarchy. So in these type of connotations, but um, but that uh, in a similar way they are transparent as the periphrastic forms. You have all the same pieces there. It's just that the verb root, like there in ekarri, the same verb that is up there. So you have the verb root kar that's in in the middle, <laughs> and then uh, if you have the synthetic form dakarski usu, it's actually the same as the ekarsendiski usu. Uh, you bring those to us. But you have the same elements there, but the, the verb root is in the middle. And the same with this naraman, uh, uh, eraman, uh, to take, you take me, naramasu. So you, <laughs> you see how it works. And what these people, they were doing, they were uh, making these kind of, with their interlingual and interlingual analogies, uh, they were turning first, like usually periphrastic Basque verb synthetic. Uh, for example, this I'm bored, asper and nice. They were using it as nasper. So, or atsegi, yeah, there's a mistake, atsegin dut, that segit, and so on. Uh, but they were also using these Spanish colloquial verbs as the verb root and making these synthetic verbs. Uh, with that, those verb roots, like the, um, in Spanish is a flipa, which means something like that's crazy. So they were using it with this Basque, uh, da flipa, me mola, uh, in Spanish, like, oh, I think that's cool, na mola. So um, they were using it with, with these Basque grammatical elements as synthetic verbs. And then they also made like loans translations uh, of Spanish colloquial expressions. Um, there's this expression in Spanish like echamos un polvo, which means uh, like let's have sex. Uh, but its literal dance translation is something like let's throw a dust or something. So they take the word polvo or dust and they, they take the Basque word out, outsa which is uh, dust, and they make it a synthetic verb, dautsagu. So it's kind of... Using the um, very creative forms of, <laughs> of um, for new innovations. So, and this is a conscious creation of the, uh, like the group style colloquial register, and for their innovations as a basis, they use the Spanish resources as conversational code switching and borrowings and loan translations, and also these dialects and loan words and expressions. But, um, and like using this, um, turning these periphrastic verbs synthetic, or using these Spanish elements to create new synthetic verbs. Uh, they could create these kind of surprising combinations. So they were combining archaic features, actually formal, very formal features, with colloquial and even vulgar elements, uh, which was the source for humor in this uh, group style. 
but they were very uh, aware that uh, this kind of group that is very context bound and it stays inside the group. So uh, they said that you need to have the common ground to to speak this way, that everyone has to understand what is going on. And um, I was I asked them so what they were thinking that because they saw that the people in Bilbao they were lacking this um, colloquia register. So if they thought that something that they were, were creating there could be something that could expand and people could um, start recycling these ideas. Uh, but Jon told, that, told me that, that, okay, it's kind of, Basque has always been spoken in small communities, very tight-knit communities, and it's even part of the linguistic tradition which I thought was a very <laughs> nicely connecting the, the present day to, to the past of the language. So that's true. Uh, the dialectal fragmentation in the Basque country is very, the dialects are very fragmented. Even almost all different farmhouses have their own local vernaculars because uh, it has been used in, in these small communities, you know, mountainous area and so. But it was important for them, for this particular friend group, that they could create their own register for their own communicative purposes. And then the others, other groups can create their own colloquial registers. And I think he's absolutely right. So uh, I think that's a very realistic view. But I was just wondering if, if this kind of creation of a colloquial register I don't think it's something that you can ask, actually ask people to do in order to participate in the Basque-speaking community or becoming Euskalduna. Um, it's usually um, the new Basque speakers, they are subject to these purist constraints uh, because then their language varieties are and themselves at the same time are perceived as artificial. And usually, for example, when they use code switching or try to experiment with the language, the native Basque speakers often interpret it as bad language, or they do it because they don't, they don't know how to speak right, which of course limits the, the ways that they can use the language. Um, at the same time, um, they are not as limited as the native Basque speakers maybe who have their local vernaculars uh, as their informal registers because um, in theory the new bus speakers could like mix and match and take all these elements from all these different kind of sources from Spanish from different dialects and there are many people who actually do that also they mix and match features of different dialects uh, but it also requires this <laughs> very strong commitment to the language to create your own register. And uh, also linguistic confidence to trespass these purist constraints. And in this group of speakers, uh, they had all these language-related professions, uh, which are also a source of linguistic authority. Even though they don't have this authority of native speakers, they have the background in studies that grant them authority. And also they have a very high degree of this multilingual awareness or linguistic awareness to create uh, these um, analogies. So, <laughs> This is about it, so um, there were two levels of participation that I wanted to discuss here. First was the concept of Euskalduna and how it's kind of participation-based or language-based identity. But then again, um, um, many speakers are not directly accepted as Euskalduna, even though they <laughs> take these participatory measures to uh, to participate in the in the Basque culture, in the Basque language culture, and then some speakers um, to overcome this inauthenticity, they have started creating their own colloquial registers. But also, there's quite a lot of commitment and all types, different types of linguistic capital that is needed to to be able to do that and. Uh, I think most new speakers, very few 
new speakers of Basque actually have these kind of resources. Yeah, there's the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. <laughs> I think many of you might know that. Okay. <laughs> yeah.